92nd Street Y Online Media is made possible by the generous support of listeners like you. This program features Swedish poet Tomas Tranströmer reading from his work. It was recorded on January 9, 1989, before a live audience at New York's 92nd Street Y. Well, I think I will start with a very early poem from 1957. It's called Balakirev's Dream, translated by May Svensson and Leif Sjöberg. Uh, it's, uh, it's about the dream I had, really, myself uh, at the time. And uh, I think uh, my dream was about two-thirds of this poem. And the rest is written in a more, uh, uh, more of an awake state. Uh, it's a word called droshki here, which me is a carriage, a Russian uh, four-wheeled carriage. And Balakiri was a composer, 1837 to 1910. Balakirev's dream, 1905. The black grand piano the shiny spider, trembled in the center of its net of music. In the concert hall was conjured a land where the stones were no heavier than dew. But Balakirev fell asleep during the music and dreamed a dream about the Tsar's droshki. It wheeled out over the cobblestones and straight into the crow cawing dark. He sat alone in the carriage, looking out. At the same time, he ran beside it on the road. He knew the journey had been long, and his watch showed years, not hours. There was a field where the plow lay, and the plow was a fallen bird. There was an inlet where the vessel lay, ice bound, lights out, the crew on deck. The droshki raced out on the ice, the wheels spun and spun with the sound of silk. A minor man of war, Sevastopol, he stood on board. The crew came forward. Your life is spared if you can play. They showed him a fabulous instrument. It was like a tuba or a phonograph or part of some unknown engine. Helpless with fear, he understood this was the piston that drove the man of war. He turned and faced the nearest sailor, made desperate signs with his hands and begged, make the sign of the cross, make the cross. The sailor's eyes turned sad as a blind man's. His arms stretched out, his head dropped forward, there he hung, as if nailed in the air. The drums beat, the drums beat, applause. Balakirev woke up from his dream. Wings of applause flapped in the hall. He saw the man at the Grand get up. In the street was blackout because of the strike. Droshkis wheeled by swiftly in the night. I go over to rather recent things. Here is a poem called Streets in Shanghai, which was uh, uh, what remained from different scribblings in uh, little notebooks, 
when I visited Shanghai in 1985. Perhaps I should mention uh, what a viper schnapps is. This is a, a very strong Chinese drink where um, a snake, a viper, is put into a bottle of uh, brandy for four or five years or so. And uh, it gives an unforgettable uh, taste. <clears throat> The rest is probably understandable. <laughs> Streets in Shanghai. Many in the park are reading the white butterfly. I love that cabbage butterfly as if it were a fluttering corner of truth itself. At dawn, the running crowd set our silent planet going. Then the park fills with people. For each one, eight faces, polished like jade, for all situations, to avoid mistakes. For each one, also the invisible face that reflects something you don't talk about something that emerges in tired moments and is as pungent as a sip of viper snaps with its long, scaly aftertaste. The carp in the pond are always moving. They swim while they are sleeping. They are an example for the faithful, always in motion. Now it's noon. The washing flutters in the gray sea wind high above the cyclists who come in tight shoals. Notice the labyrinths to the sides. I'm surrounded by written characters I can't interpret. I'm illiterate through and through. But I have paid what I am supposed to, and I have receipts for everything. I have gathered so many unreadable receipts. I'm an old tree with withered leaves that hang on and can't fall to earth. And the gust from the sea rustles all these receipts. At dawn, the trudging crowds set our silent planet going. We are all on board the street. It's as crowded as the deck of a ferry. Where are we going? Are there enough teacups? We can consider ourselves fortunate for getting on this street in time. It's a thousand years before the birth of claustrophobia. <laughs> Behind each one walking here hovers a cross that wants to catch up to us. Pass us, join us. Something that wants to sneak up on us from behind and cover our eyes and whisper, guess who? We look almost happy out in the sun while we bleed to death from wounds we know nothing about. Here is a poem about the painter Vermeer. As you know, Vermeer van Delft, he, he lived in the 17th century, and you probably have memories of, of seeing his paintings or reproductions of them. Very calm, very serene, very uh, spiritual paintings, which give the, impressions, the impression that this was a fellow who had a very calm life, but actually his life was full of stress. He had 13 children, he had a lot of trouble with the mother-in-law and the brother-in-law especially, who was a psychopath, uh, who lived in the family, and so on. So this is a poem about the relation between life and art. And it's especially 
one painting that's important here. It uh, uh, shows a pregnant woman in profile uh, uh, in a blue dress and uh, reading a letter in Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Vermeer. No sheltered world. On the other side of the wall, the noise begins. The tavern begins with laughter and bickering, rows of teeth, tears, the din of bells, and the mentally disordered brother-in-law, the bearer of death that everyone must tremble for. The great explosion and the delayed tramp of rescues the boats that strut at anchor, the money that creeps into the pocket of the wrong person, demands piled on demands, cusps of gaping red flowers that sweat premonitions of war. Away from there and straight through the wall into the bright studio, into the second that goes on living for hundreds of years, paintings titled The Music Lesson or Woman in Blue Reading a Letter. She's in her eighth mouth, two hearts kicking inside her. On the wall behind her hangs a wrinkled map of terra incognita. Breathe calmly. An unknown blue material is nailed to the chair. The gold upholstery tacks flew in with unheard of speed and stopped abruptly, as if they had never been anything but stillness. The ears ring with either, either depth or height. It's the pressure from the other side of the wall that leaves every fact suspended and holds the brush steady. It hurts to go through walls. It makes you sick, but it's necessary. The world is one, but walls. And the wall is part of yourself. Whether you know it or not, it's the same for everyone. Everyone except little children. No walls for them. The clear sky has set itself on a slant against the wall. It's like a prayer to emptiness. And the emptiness turns its face to us and whispers, I am not empty. I am open. That was translations by uh, Samuel Charters. Here is a short, here's another painting of a, of a woman. It's called Portrait of a Lady in 19th Century. I read it in Swedish first. It's, it's rather regular Swedish verse. Sapphic meter. Kvinnu portrait, 1800 Rösten kvävs i klänningen, hennes ögon följer gladiatorn. Och sedan står hon på arenan själv. Är hon fri? En guldram gastkramar tavlan. The dress chokes her voice, her eyes follow the gladiator. Then she herself stands in the arena. Is she free? A gold frame strangles the painting.
Here is a pro prose piece called Madrigal, which Rika translated beautifully in the program. So you will have another translation now by John F. Dean. <laughs> <laughs> I inherited a dark wood to which I seldom go. But a day will come when the dead and the living change places. Then the wood will begin to stir. We are not without hope. The most serious crimes remain unsolved despite the efforts of many policemen. In the same way, there exists somewhere in our lives a great love unsolved. I inherited the dark wood, but today I'm going into another wood, the bright one. Every living thing that sings, wriggles, oscillates, and crawls. It is spring, and the air is very strong. I have a degree from Oblivion's University and am as empty-handed as the shirt on the clothesline. Here is a poem which is not... This was very Swedish, wasn't it? Uh, but... Uh, here is not Sweden, it's called Deep in Europe. And actually, it's, most of it is Strasbourg, and the little part is Köln, too. <clears throat> Deep in Europe. I, a dark hull floating between two lock gates, rest in the hotel bed while the city around me wakens. The silent clamor and the gray light stream in and raise me slowly to the next level, the morning. Overheard horizon. They want to say something, the dead. They smoke but don't eat. They don't breathe but they keep their voice. I'll be hurrying through the streets as one of them. The blackened cathedral, heavy as a moon, causes ebb and flow. <clears throat> Leaflet. The silent rage scribbles on the walls within. Fruit trees in bloom, the cuckoo calls. It's the anesthesia of spring but the silent rage paints its slogans backwards in the garage. We see everything and nothing, but upright like periscopes handled by the underworld's shy crew. It's the war of the minutes. The blazing sun stands above the hospital, suffering's parking place. We living nails hammered down in society. One day we'll come loose from everything. We'll feel the wind of death under our wings and become milder and wilder than here. Flygblad. Det tysta raseriet klottrar på vägen inåt. Fruktträd i blom, jöken ropar. Det är vårens narkos. Men det tysta raseriet målar sina slagord baklänges i garagen. Vi ser allt och ingenting, men raka som periskop hanterade av underjordens skygga besättning. Det är minuternas krig, den gassande solen. Står över lasarettet, lidandets parkering. Vi levande spikar nedhamrade i samhället. En dag ska vi lossna från allt. Vi ska känna dödens luft under vingarna. 
och bli mildare och vildare än här. I will end this with a longer poem, if I can find it, uh, which is called Golden Wasp. Golden Wasp is, a, is an insect. Uh, which uh, is rather common in, in Sweden at last. I think um, most people have seen it in the summer, but they didn't know the name of it. It's a sort of brilliant, jewel-like insect, which is a very, very uh, unimportant character in this poem. So I took it just to give the poem a, na a name. <coughs> it is um, a poem about the Swedish summer day, the 5th of July, 1987. But uh, uh, it develops into a discussion about the perversion of good religious impulses. We can take about, uh, uh, think about uh, people like uh, uh, Jim Jones or Ayatollah Khomeini and so on, whatever you like. Crisis ignita is the Latin name of that insect. <clears throat> Golden wasp. The blind worm, that legless lizard, flows along the porch step, calm and majestic as an anaconda. Only the size is different. The sky is covered with clouds, but the sun pushes through that kind of day. This morning, she who is dear to me drove away the evil spirits. As when you open the door of a dark shed somewhere in the south, and the light pours in, and the cockroaches dart quick, quick off into the corners and up the walls and are gone. You saw them and you didn't see them. So her nakedness made the demons run, as if they never existed. But they will come back with a thousand hands which make the wrong connections in the old-fashioned telephone exchange of the nerves. It's the 5th of July. The lupins are stretching up as if they wanted to catch sight of the sea. It's the church of taciturnity, in piety not according to the letter, as if the implacable faces of the patriarchs didn't exist. And the misspelling of God's name in stone. I saw it through to the letter TV preacher who had piled in the money. But he was weak now and needed the support of a bodyguard. Who was a well-tailored young man with a smile tight as a gag. A smile stifling a scream. The scream of a child left alone in a bed in the hospital when the parents leave. The divine brushes against the man and lights a flame, but then draws back. Why? The flame attracts the shadows. They fly rustling into the flame and join it. It rises and blackens, and the smoke spreads out black and strangling. At last, only the black smoke. At last, only the pious executioner. The pious executioner leans forward over the square and the crowd that makes a grainy mirror 
where he can see himself. The greatest fanatic is the greatest doubter, without knowing it. He's a pact between two, where the one is 100% visible and the other invisible. How I hate that expression, 100%. Those who can never live anywhere except from their facades, those who are never absent-minded, those who never open the wrong door and catch a glimpse of the unidentified one, walk past them. It's the 5th of July. The sky is covered with clouds, but the sun pushes through. The blind worm flows along the porch step calm and majestic as an anaconda. The blind worm, as if there were no civil service. The golden wasp, as if there were no idolatry. The lupins, as if there were no 100%. I know the depth where one is both prisoner and ruler like Persephone. I often lay in the stiff grass there and saw the earth arch over me, the vault of the earth, often. That's half my life. But today my sight has left me. My blindness has gone away. The dark bat has left my face and is scissoring in summer's bright space. Thank you. Thanks for listening. 92nd Street Y, Unterberg Poetry Center webcasts, and access to our archive are made possible by the generous support of listeners like you. For more information on 92nd Street Y and all our programs, please visit us on the web at 92y.org. This program is copyright 1989 by 92nd Street Y.